Um, this episode is going to be about the Ark and the wars it was a part of before, and those it eventually will be in in the future. Now, the Ark was the throne of God on earth, and not just an item in a sanctuary system. This is why it had two different tasks. But both tasks were different aspects of a throne. One of the aspects was that it was standing in the sanctuary that was meant to reunite man with God. The other aspect was to lead the people. It is written about the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant of the Lord went before them in the three days journey to search out a resting place for them. And the cloud of the Lord was upon them by day when they went out of the camp. And it came to pass, when the ark set forward, that Moses said, Rise up, Lord, and let thine enemies be scattered, and let them that hate thee flee before thee. And when it rested, he said, Return, O Lord, unto the many thousands of Israel. And they commanded the people, saying, When ye see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God, and the priests, the Levites, bearing it, then ye shall remove from your place, and go after it. Yet there shall be a space between you and it, about two thousand cubits by measure. Come not near unto it, that ye may know the way by which ye must go, for ye have not passed this way hereto before. Here it is specified that the Lord moved with the ark, leading the people onward. They had been told to enter the land of Canaan, the land promised to Abraham. However, Abraham did not get to possess the land while he was alive. The Lord said to him, And thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace. Uh, thou shalt be buried in a good old age. But in the fourth generation they shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. Now that the Israelites were to enter the land, at the same time they were to execute God's judgment over the nations that lived there, who had had a probation time of 400 years, yet they had failed to repent. The Lord of the Ark with his throne leads them across the Jordan River. Behold, the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of all the earth passeth over before you in Jordan. Notice that it says, of the Lord of all the earth. You see, in the ark lay the claim that he was Lord of all the earth, and with this was the claim that he could judge the inhabitants of the earth as if they were a part of his jurisdiction. This is important to understand. Like I mentioned in an earlier episode, Israel had entered into a covenant with the Lord, saying they would be true to the requirements of his kingdom, and so they received a special tasks as mediators or as a priesthood before the world. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. When they entered into this land, they were to assist God in his judgment against the city of Jericho. And they crossed around here. And Jericho was right here. They were to carry the ark around the walls, the city walls, once every day for six days. And the seventh day, they were to carry it seven times around the city walls. Then the Lord shook down the walls of Jericho, and the people of Israel completed the judgment over the inhabitants. Now, as we will see in a later episode, the number seven is closely connected with cleansing and judgment. So the act of walking around the city seven times was symbolic of God's judgment over the city. Remember, God had tried to change the ways of these people for about 400 years without success. The ark joined the battle because it contained the law of God that had been broken by these people, and it contained God's right to judge them and sentence them. His seal was given to this war. The next war the Israelites fought, they lost. It turned out that one of the Israelites had taken clothing and gold from the remains of Jericho. God had told them specifically not to do this, so God did not give them victory in the next battle. You see, the condition for them to be a part of God's kingdom under his special protection was that they kept their part of the covenant. 
When they did this, they were inhabitants of the kingdom of God. When they broke the covenant, they were rebels, unable to punish their fellow transgressors or fight for God's honor. One can't keep rebels against the law of the kingdom as a part of the Lord's army. It would be like having a corrupt police force or a corrupt judge. Nothing is more unfair than that. That the people executing judgment for justice sake are no better than the ones they are executing judgment over. So the people of Israel had to condemn the act of this particular man and then God would again lead the wars to victory. So the ark was significant in the wars because one, it contained the law that would judge the people sinning against it. Two, it contained God's seal of kingship, his Sabbath sign. And three, those who had entered into a covenant with God and turned away from their sins were admitted back to the kingdom of God and under God's protection and were also elected to be judges over their fellow humans. So. If the Israelites didn't have the ark, they would have no right to judge these nations or execute God's judgment over the other people. At one time, Israel had a priesthood right here in Shiloh where the ark stood. The priest here was called Eli and not to be confused with Elijah. His two sons were priests, but they did not follow God's requirements and used their position to exploit the people. This angered the Lord and he told Eli that the priesthood would be taken away from him. Wherefore the Lord of God of Israel saith, I said indeed that thy house and the house of thy father should walk before me for ever. But now the Lord saith, Be it far from me, for them that honor me I will honor, and they that despise me shall be lightly esteemed. Now at this time the Israelites were constantly in conflict with the Philistines and they were about to go to war against them. This is why they got the idea to bring the ark into battle with them, thinking it would give them a certain victory. Let us fetch the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord out of Shiloh unto us, that when it cometh among us, it may save us out of the hands of our enemies. So the people sent to Shiloh, that they might bring from thence the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of hosts, which dwelleth between the cherubims. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. And when the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord came into the camp, all Israel shouted with a great shout, so that the earth rang again. And when the the Philistines heard this noise of the shout, they said, What meaneth the noise of this great shout in the camp of the Hebrews? And they understood that the Ark of the Lord was come into the camp. And the Philistines were afraid, for they said, God is come into the camp. And they said, Woe unto us, for there hath not been such a thing hereto before. Despite the fear, they go into battle, and even to their own surprise, they win. And even captures the ark that they placed into their Dagon temple in Ashdod, right here. A little south of the modern city of Ashdod, there has been found ancient city remains that archaeologists have recognized as an old Philistine city. What we see here is that the throne itself did not have superpowers on its own. If the Lord of the Ark didn't join the battle, the Ark couldn't help them. At this time, both the Philistines and the Israelites were in conflict with God's kingdom, his law, that were inside the Ark. So God did not give the Israelites any advantage in the conflict. In the same manner, Yeshua once claimed that people would try and use his name, but it wouldn't do them any good. He said, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works, and then will I profess unto them, I never knew you, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. The word iniquity here is the Greek word anomia, which literally means in violation to the law. You see, many battles have been fought in the name of Christ, 
as well. The Crusaders and other awful wars during the Middle Ages. However, notice how these wars were fought by Christians who were in violation of God's law. They who had changed God's seal, the Sabbath, to another day Sunday, by the authority of the Pope. They who had images of God which they fell down before and prayed in front of. They were in violation of the law of God. They, they did not carry the seal of God. So even though they claimed to fight in the name of Yeshua, they were abusing the name for their own cause. The name can according to Yeshua, not force the man that owns the name to join the battle, just like it was with the Ark. Bringing the Ark could not force the master of the Ark to join the battle. The sign that signified if the children of Israel represented the king was if they kept his laws. If they didn't, they didn't represent him. When someone wanted to buy the Holy Spirit from Christ's apostles, they told him that he had to convert and change his ways before receiving it and that it could not be purchased with money. The Apostle Peter said, And we are his witnesses of these things, and so is also the Holy Ghost, whom God has given to them that obey him. Of those who were going to represent him to the world, Yeshua said, If you love me, Keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. You see, every covenant goes both ways. It doesn't matter if you have the letter or the law written on stone, if the law is not in your heart. What makes you a citizen of the kingdom of God is not God's requirements, but actually the fulfillment of them in you. That is why God said about the new covenant that he would enter. Behold, the day comes, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. That is why Yeshua said, and when he was demanded of the Pharisees when the kingdom of God should come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God cometh not with observation, neither shall they say, Lo here or lo there, for, behold, the kingdom of God is within you. God's kingdom is a matter of free will. The laws would be in his citizens' hearts and would not be a threatening finger from the outside, like many Israelites felt about the law in their days. So God's kingdom is a bond between man and God, a bond of love-based obedience rather than fear-based obedience. Why then would the stone law be a part of the new covenant? Well, because it's still God's throne on earth, showing God's requirements for the inhabitants of the earth, the law every man will be judged after. But the fulfillment of the covenant is God writing the law in the hearts of those who join in the covenant. It's like if you buy a house. You sign a agreement, but the agreement is just a witness. The fulfillment of the agreement is you getting the actual house and moving into it. Then the contract remains in case either parties would break their agreement. So God writing the law in the hearts is like you getting the house to live in. While the evidence of what law would be written there and who would pay for it is on the ark. As John said, and there are three that bear witness in earth, the spirit and the water and the blood, and these three agree in one. And uh, the word witness here is a word for evidence. When the Philistines captured the ark, they placed it before their god Dagon, which was customary in those days. They thought their god Dagon had given them victory over the god of the Israelites, and so they put the symbol of Dagon's victory there, the ark, to show Dagon's supremacy. But, but as it was written about the ark, behold the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth. The Philistines refused to acknowledge the true God, but he did not leave them outside his jurisdiction. 
The law that condemned them as violators of God's kingdom was suddenly in the middle of their camp, and God would not remain silent as an answer to the mocking of him having fallen to a demon god, Dagon. And when day of Ashtod arose early on the morning, Behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face to the earth before the ark of the Lord, and they took Dagon and set him in his place again. And when they arose early on the mor morrow morning, behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord, and the head of Dagon, and both the palms of his hands, were cut off upon the threshold. Only the stump of Dagon was left to him. So here God tells them that Dagon was without hands meaning without the ability to save them and without head without the ability to think or act or lead but they continued worshiping dagon and despising the lord of the ark even though he had proven himself as the supreme god god's judgment had come to them and they had no will to change their ways or to repent but the hand of the Lord was heavy upon them of Ashdod, and he destroyed them, and smote them with emeralds, even Ashdod and the coats thereof. And when the men of Ashdod saw that it was so, they said, The ark of the Lord, the God of Israel, shall not abide with us, for his hand is score upon us, and upon Dagon our God. And it was so, that after they had carried it about, the hand of the Lord was against the city with a very great destruction, and he smote the men of the city, both small and great, and they had emeralds in their secret parts. The people of Ashdod sent the ark to another Philistine city called Gath, the same place the giant Goliath originated from, and there has been found remains of the ancient Philistine city seen here again confirming the truthfulness and accuracy of the Bible. But also the people of Goth were struck with plagues and destruction, and they no longer wanted to have the ark with them, so they sent it to a third Philistine city called Ekron. These old remains that are filmed for you here dates back to the old Philistine city. They were also struck with plagues and decided to send the ark back to Israel. Now the closest city was Bet Shemesh, right here, and here is the archaeological remains of that old Israelite city. So the Philistines decided to get rid of the Lord's throne and sent it back to the Israelites. They took a new cart and two milk kine, and tied the kine to the cart, and they laid the ark of the Lord upon the cart and sent it towards the Israeli border at that time. The Bible tells that the men of Israel that was out on the fields here, could see the cart coming and was happy to hear it was the ark. They approached it, and the people of Bet Shemesh showed disrespect by peering into the ark of the Lord. They were instantly punished. Even he smote of the people fifty thousand and threescore and ten men, and the people lamented, because the Lord had smitten many of the people with a great slaughter. And the men of Bet Shemesh said, Who is able to stand before the Holy Lord God? And to whom shall he go up from us? And they sent messengers to inhabitants of Kiryat Yarim, saying, The Philistines have brought again the ark of the Lord. Come ye down and fetch it up to you. So as we see here, also the Israelites that were showing disrespect, uh, was punished by God as the Philistines were. Now the ark was then taken into the house of Abinadab who unlike the Philistines and the men of Bet Shemesh was blessed for having the ark with him. Again we see the same the ark being God's throne but also containing what points us out as transgressors and that it will fight the wars of God's kingship. Those who rebel without being in a covenant, including both parties, or in a sanctuary system to reunite man with God's kingdom, were judged by the law of God. The only times we hear about the Ark in the New Testament is when Paul is talking about it in the book of Hebrews, saying there is an Ark in heaven also. The next time is in the book of Revelation. Here the Ark and also the temple in heaven is mentioned twice. 
once in Revelation chapter 11, saying the temple in heaven is opened, the ark is seen, and then there are lightning and thunder. The other time is in chapter 15 verse 5. Both places the ark is mentioned at a time of judgment over the inhabitants of the earth. The second time we can read how plagues will come from the temple after the ark is opened and the vials of wrath is carried to our planet. Let's have a look. And after that I looked, and behold the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was open, and the seven angels came out of the temple, having the seven plagues, clothed in pure and white linen, and having their breasts girded with golden girdles. And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your ways and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. This proves several things. It shows God's law is still existing and is the base all men will be judged according to. Those who refuse to acknowledge the base of God's kingship will be destroyed as rebels and afflicted with plagues. The existence of the laws claiming he is rightfully king of the earth doesn't secure us a place in his kingdom. Only those who have entered into a covenant with God and received the law in their hearts are members of his kingdom. Therefore it is written two places of those being spared from the wrath of God and instead are under the wrath of the fallen cherub or dragon and it's mentioned twice in the book of Revelation. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Keep the law and you are in conflict with the dragon. Break it and you are in conflict with God and are under his wrath. Many are those who want to find the ark, just to use it as an argument that they are under the banner of God. Likewise, there are many who use the blood of Christ and his name as an argument and evidence that they are citizens of the kingdom of God. However, the biblical sign during the time of the Israelites, and still is today among Yeshua's followers, is not if we have the name, the ark the name would dwell with, or the ark, but if we are in harmony with God's kingdom by respecting God's law and seal. And one day, according to Revelation, all those who continue in violation will be judged according to the law inside the ark. This will then perhaps be the final war the ark will be in, at the end where only those bought free by the atoning blood and who have ceased rebellion against God's law will remain and be a part of God's new kingdom. In Isaiah the destruction of man is portrayed and the cause of this final destruction is explained. Behold the Lord maketh the earth empty and maketh it waste and turneth it upside down and scattered abroad the inhabitants thereof. The land shall be utterly emptied and utterly spoiled for the Lord has spoken this word. The earth also is defiled under the inhabitants thereof, because they have transgressed the laws, changed the ordinance, broken the everlasting covenant. Therefore hath the curse devoured the earth, and they that dwell therein are desolate. Therefore the inhabitants of the earth are burned, and few men left. In the book written to the Hebrews, it says that also those who reject the blood of the covenant is without protection. Of how much sore punishment, suppose ye, shall he be thought worthy who has trodden under the foot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace? For we know him that he has said, Vengeance belongeth unto me, and I will recompense, says the Lord, and again the Lord shall judge his people. Today we must enter into this covenant and partake in the blood of the covenant in order to receive the law in our hearts, to be represented by the mediator in heaven and being spared of the coming judgment that will be set from the ark. 
And don't worry, we will look more into what the Bible says about the Ark and the Judgment and the Last War in a later episode. The next episode, episode 7, is called The Ark and the Feast Days. However, I will upload episode 8, The Ark and the Third Temple, first. I hope this is okay, and thank you for listening.